Every time you made a phone call, the NSA literally got a copy of it delivered to them the next day. Um, they were tracking the locations of people around the world. Anything that passed by their systems ingested, right? It was brought into our databases. Think about it, you have every text message, you have every email, you have every web request. Uh, you know where every cell phone in the world is because you have access to um, the records of where they're located. And when you take all of this in aggregate, what we were building and what we were trying to store uh, to a greater and greater distance uh, every year was history's first permanent record of everyone's life. All of these things we were moving around, all of these secrets we were stealing uh, would be saved and stored and backed up. So even if a building was blown up, nothing would ever be lost. When you think about what the CIA does, when you think about what the NSA does, you are, <laughs> you're at least supposed to think um, that they spy on bad guys. They're looking at particularized people that they have a suspicion they're engaged in some kind of wrongdoing. Well, the systems that I had built, the systems that my generation had built, uh, had produced a system that instead spied on everyone. A private company, let's say Apple and Google, are in all of our smartphones. They gather all the data from our phones. Now, it would be very hard for the government to get into every phone. But if they get into these two companies, they get all the data anyways. <laughs> so we have this situation that there is not government surveillance anymore and private surveillance, but they merge, they become more and more one thing. The reality is Google and Facebook will figure out more about every Hungarian at the same time than the government will reasonably be able to do. At the same time, a government is much more able to actually raid your place and you know have serious consequences from it. So it's a bit of a different threat model. The one is more broad that covers everybody in a way, um, but probably not as deep. The other one may be more narrow, but deeper, and which is much more of a problem for you know, journalists or you know, opposition people or all these kind of typical vulnerable groups or lawyers, stuff like that. So it's a bit of a different situation. And then it depends in each country how much th these two systems cooperate with each other. But we see that there's pressure mounting as well. Like the UK has already said, we want to have access to these platform data. Um, other countries do that as well. So these two worlds may merge more and more in the future. If in 10 years there's a law saying under EU law, each member state's police can get this data on request, then suddenly these two things just became one. <laughs> so it's very hard to differentiate. And I think all of this becomes more messy and, and, and more intertwined at the same time. The problem in the US is that if you're not a US citizen, you do not have a fundamental right to privacy. So there's a Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution, but it only applies to US citizens. So if a European's data goes into the cloud, into Facebook, into the Google cloud, into all these products, we have no rights in the US. They can just take the data without any judge ever approving it, without any system that would check on what they do. And that is exactly what Snowden has disclosed, that there are surveillance programs that do exactly that, that they basically take out all the data, analyze it, and do what we call mass surveillance. A number of institutions uh, both governmental and corporate, uh, realized it was in their mutual interest to conceal their data collection activities, to increase uh, the breadth and depth of their sensor networks that were uh, sort of spread out through society. This was intentionally concealed from us, right? Uh, the government did it, they used classification. Um, companies did it, uh, they intentionally didn't talk about it, they denied uh, these things were going. They, they said, uh, you agreed to this and you didn't agree to nothing like this. I'm, I'm sorry, right? right? They go, we put that terms of service page up and, and you clicked that. You clicked a button that said, I agree because you were trying to open an account so you could talk to your friends. You were trying to get driving directions. You were trying to get an email account. You weren't trying to agree to some 600 page legal form uh, that even if you read, you wouldn't understand. And it doesn't matter even if you did understand because one of the very first paragraphs in it said, this agreement can be changed at any time unilaterally without your consent by the company. This is data about human lives. It is data about people. These records are, are about you. It's not data that's being exploited. It's people that are being exploited. It's not um, data that's being manipulated. It's you.
the governments have no interest to look into the surveillance parts because they oftentimes work together. So we have a situation that, for example, Americans do not have rights in Britain when it comes to mass surveillance. British don't have rights in the US. So if you have a cable from, from the UK to the US, everybody but UK people have no rights in the UK. Everybody but US people have no rights in the US. Now, if the data flows in between, you make sure that everybody has no rights at some point. <laughs> now, if you also know that they work together in the Five Eyes and later exchange the data, this setup is actually quite convenient for old governments because they can surveil their own people or outsource the surveillance of their own people to another country and get the results back in the end. So it's a combination of all these factors that no one wanted to touch the topic. Only very specific industry sectors realize that. So for example, if you're an oil company, you would probably never put any of your data in there because you know, you know, once you've found an oil field, no one else should know about it. But for the general public, the idea was, let's just not talk about it and pretend it doesn't exist. I think the situation that the US is going to get into is a bit like Switzerland with gold. Let's say they say, give us all your gold, we take care of it. That's a bit of what they do with cloud storage, with data. They say, give us all your data, we take care of it. Now imagine you wouldn't have a right to property once your gold is in Switzerland, because only Swiss people have a right to property then no one would give gold to Switzerland because your property would be gone in the moment it crosses the border. Now, that's a bit what the US does with surveillance, that they say, give us all your data, but once the data is in the US, you have no rights to that data anymore from a surveillance perspective. And I think a lot of people, this first case, it was a wake-up call for them. They've never really thought where their data goes. They just thought, okay, it's Google, and Google is a cloud, you know? <laughs> but Google is not a cloud, it's servers somewhere in the US that physically are there and that the NSA has access to. We have to keep data in Europe. Unfortunately, I don't think it's smart, but unless we have guarantees abroad, then we cannot send data there. A lot of these American surveillance laws are espionage laws. So it goes beyond the mere privacy question, it goes into business secrets, it goes into diplomatic secrets, into many of these areas where Europe has a fundamental interest that this data is not in the US. A lot of these decisions in practice are done because of political pressure. The US just has a lot of market power, a lot of pressure. Most of the European Union is connected to the US through NATO, through a lot of these alliances, and they simply get away with stuff that no other country in the world would probably get away with. Please welcome to the stage Alexander Nix, Chief Executive Officer, Cambridge Analytica. Only 18 months ago, Senator Cruz was one of the less popular candidates seeking nomination and certainly one of the more vilified. The Cruz campaign was quick to embrace three technologies. The first of these was behavioral science. Most communication companies today still segment their audiences by demographics and geographics. But when you pause for just a moment, this is a really ridiculous idea. The idea that all women should receive the same message because of their gender, or all African Americans because of their race. Clearly, demographics and geographics and economics will influence your worldview. But equally important, or probably more important, are psychographics. That is an understanding of your personality, because it's personality that drives behavior, and behavior that obviously influences how you vote. This is the cutting edge in experimental psychology known as the OCEAN model. OCEAN being an acronym for openness, how open you are to new experiences. Conscientiousness, whether you prefer order and habits and planning in your life. Extroversion, how social you are. Agreeableness, whether you put other people's needs and society and community ahead of yourself. And finally, neuroticism, a measurement of how much you tend to worry. By having hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Americans undertake this survey, we were able to form a model to predict the personality of every single adult in the United States of America. So how does this impact marketing and communications in elections? If you know the, the personality of the people you're targeting, you can nuance your messaging to resonate more effectively with those key audience groups. So for a highly neurotic and conscientious audience, you're going to need a message that is rational and fear-based or emotionally based. In this case, uh, the threat of a burglary and the insurance policy of a gun is very persuasive. 
Conversely, for a closed and agreeable audience, these are people who care about tradition and habits and family and community. This could be the, the grandfather who taught his son to shoot and the, the father who will in turn teach his son. The second leg of the stool, data analytics. Big data is really the aggregation of as many individual data points that you can possibly get your hands on. This could include demographic and geographic factors, age, gender, ethnicity, religion, and so forth or psychographic or attitudinal factors. This is uh, consumer and lifestyle habits, what car you drive, uh, what products you purchase in shops, what magazines you read, what golf clubs you belong to, and of course, personality or behavioral data. This is what we talked about earlier, how you see the world, what actually drives you. If you look at the whole political influence and so on, to do trolling, to do influence of elections and so on, Facebook for them is a tool, and the tool gives you all the information you need to think, you know, how can I nudge that person into a different political opinion? How can I confront that person with certain information that may upset them more than another person? So this, uh, what they call micro-targeting. We don't necessarily need to have a political debate anymore to say, what do we want content-wise? But we can have one politician giving different spins and opinions and messages to each person individually. So, and it was interesting to see that even in the Austrian election, when we had Kurz, um, our right-wing conservative guy that is now the prime minister, when I was talking to different people, they voted for that person for totally different opinions. Like the one was like, you know, he's going to help us as an employee to get more money and, you know, blah, 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 and to be better protected. The other was like, we have to make sure that the rights for employees are uh, limited and that is what Kurz is going to do. So you have like two people having the exact opposite political opinion voting for the same guy. But if we think about that politics is actually here to make decisions, to say, do we want to have more social security or less social security? Do we want to have more taxes and nicer roads or less taxes and broken roads, you know? All of these things is actually the reason why we have a political contest. With all the data analytics, you can uncouple that. You can say, okay, I can tell the one person better roads. I can tell the other person more, you know, money for schools. And the third person I can tell lower taxes which does not add up at all, but this overall picture is not seen by anybody anymore. Each person just sees their own little message, and that allows to totally manipulate oftentimes that political debate, something that Facebook and the data that they gather allows for the first time. I don't think that they want that necessarily. They built that system for making you feel like this is the right razor for you and this is the right you know car for you whatever but it works for politics quite well too you have a, a matrix here on the x-axis partisan partisanship value hardcore republicans on the right democrats on the left and on the y-axis people's likelihood to turn out to go and caucus the people at the top highly likely the people at the bottom not at all so already this information is quite helpful to a campaign manager but if we select some segments within this uh, matrix, it becomes even more powerful. In this case, we've zoned in on a group we've called persuasion. These are people who are definitely going to, to vote, to caucus, but they need moving from the center a little bit more towards the right in order to support Cruz. They need a persuasion message. And we can look at this group of about 45,000 people, and we can see that the mean personality is very low in neuroticism, quite low in openness, and slightly conscientious. We can segment further. We can look at what issue they care about. Gun rights I've selected. That narrows the field slightly more. And now we know that we need a message on gun rights. It needs to be a persuasion message, and it needs to be nuanced according to the certain personality that we're interested in. And we can see where these people are on the map. If we wanted to drill down further, we could resolve the data to an individual level, where we have somewhere close to four or 5,000 data points on every adult in the United States. Finally, addressable ad technology. This is the ability to take all this offline data and to match it uh, to drive communications. Blanket advertising, the idea that 100 million people receive the same piece of direct mail, the same television advert, the same digital advert, is dead. My children will certainly never ever understand this concept of mass communication. 
Today, communication is becoming ever increasingly targeted. It's being individualized for every single person in this room. So you will no longer be receiving adverts on products and services that you don't care about. Rather, you'll only receive adverts that not only are on the the products and services, or in the case of elections, issues that you care about most, but that have been nuanced in order to reflect the way you see the world. We can obviously use this data to inform direct mail purchases. So a husband in a household can receive a piece of mail, but his wife can receive a different piece of mail, possibly even on the same issue. We can take this data and match it to set-top box viewing data. That's television, uh, or cable data. Every time you watch TV, the programs that you're watching are being recorded and that information is being sent back to your cable provider. And we can match what you watch uh, in a way that we can begin to select programs to advertise in that have the highest density of the target audience that we're trying to reach. This not only dramatically reduces the cost of your advertising, but of course improves the return on investment. So what were the results? Well, Ted Cruz employed our data, our behavioral insights. He started from a base of less than 5% and had a very slow and steady but firm rise to above 35%, making him obviously the second most threatening um, contender in the race. Now, clearly the Cruz campaign is over now, but what I can tell you is that of the two candidates left, left in this election, one of them is using these technologies, and it's going to be very interesting to see how they impact the next seven weeks. Thank you. The GDPR is more of a raw data regulation, just making sure, can you have the data? Can they have it? For what can I use it? But not how can I use it? How does the algorithm work? How, you know, which elements can the algorithm try to find out or not? That's all stuff that's not regulated right now in Europe. That is something where we have no rules at all. So, so you worked on 200 political campaigns? Give or take. I, I, and surprisingly, the first, one, the, the, the first one that came into the did was Mandela, no? Yeah, we started um, engaging in elections back in 94. Over, over the last 25 years or so, 23 years, we probably worked on a couple of hundred national campaigns. That is for prime minister and presidents um, all over the world. Now, it's important to note that, that we're not a political company. We're a tech company. And many of the campaigns we work on are left of centre, as some are right of centre. What's, what's your batting average? So we tend to look at it in terms of those elections that we've worked on ourselves, that is end-to-end, -end, where we do everything from the research, the polling, the strategy, the data, the analytics, the media, the engagement. And I think up until two years ago, we had a 100% track record in those campaigns. Here's what fascinates me. You clearly have the power to substantially influence the outcome of a democratic process, which is impressive, alarming. Um, how do you decide who to work for? Well, look, firstly, we're, we're a commercial company, so um, we have to see a, a business opportunity. But it's not a business decision um, in itself. We, we only work for mainstream political parties, so we don't work with fringe parties or, or, or other smaller um, um, political affiliations. Because of the success that you've had, you must be approached in most instances by both sides of virtually any current global political campaign. And so, so I mean, there is a, 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 an awesome amount of power in deciding who you're gonna throw this better mousetrap behind well look we, we, we try to leave who, our who, ideology out of this who, otherwise who, who wouldn't you work for i think there are an awful lot of people we wouldn't necessarily work for um but th this isn't about um particular naming particular parties or countries i think this is more about are they free and fair elections uh, is democracy being uphold upheld um, uh, can our technology make an impact in a race like this um, and you know is the candidate somebody that's not going to damage our reputation um, uh, in in the wider context um. <laughs> <laughs> Layers of irony. Thank you for that. That was, that was candid. So one of the biggest lies in privacy is it's your decision. 
because the reality right now is you're locked up in a closed system and you will not have any proper decision right now oftentimes. So I think if you ask yourself what you can do, the answer is usually not much. Um, because even if you go offline, your friends are going to be on these services and share your data there. So like you can have a Facebook profile without being on Facebook because all your friends share your data with Facebook and they have so-called shadow profiles. So a lot of that is, is, is not easy. What you can do is that you try to use alternatives as well. There are certain things you can choose yourself. You can choose your email provider. You can you know, have an email provider where you pay, let's say, a euro a month and make sure that your emails are yours and not someone else's. There are open source solutions that allow you to have your own cloud where you can have all your data on your own server and use it just as well as a Google Cloud. Kind of make your footprint smaller. Um, but I don't think that other than really like changing these business models, there's a way that you can totally eliminate your um, footprint. And for myself, I still use all of these products. Like I use Facebook, I have my Twitter account, I do use messaging apps and so on. Um, because I think the, the solution to all of this is not that we can go offline again. The big fight will probably not going to win with individual change, but with like more really suing them and, and getting it into the big courts and changing the behavior of the companies directly more than the behavior of 500 million Europeans. <laughs>